Did the bell go off? No, but it's after seven. Yeah, I think it is too. Oh, there oh. we go. Speaking of which, there it is. Magic. Yeah. Evening, everyone. Let's let's get ready to get started. Let's go to our Father in prayer, and we will pick back up in our study of Acts. Let's bow. O Lord, our God, our holy and righteous Heavenly Father, how great Thou art. We're so very thankful, Father, that You have blessed us with the opportunity to be here again this evening, to assemble and open our hearts in readiness to receive Your Word, in readiness to participate in song, in prayer, and in praise to You. We pray, Father, that all things that we offer You will always be according to Your will and pleasing in Your sight. And we give thanks, Father, for the privilege to break the bread of life, your word that guides us. We pray as we come to understand it better, we come to understand how important it is that we give ourselves over to it completely, that we allow it to rule our lives in such a way as we're transformed in the presence of all those around us so they may ask us of our hope. We pray to honor you in all things that we say and all things that we do and glorify you. Let us be small so you can be great. We pray, Father, that you bless this body of Christ, that you give us strength to serve you here in this location as a light to a lost and perverted generation. We pray for the sick who can't be with us, that you comfort them and bless them. Help those who are suffering from cancers. Bless them and comfort them. Those in long-term care, those that are advanced in years, We pray that you bless all of them and help us, their brethren, to be mindful of them, to love and care for them as well. We pray, Father, that as we have opportunity to study tonight, that our minds are prepared and our hearts are ready, that we can be guided to recognize the things that we want to practice after those who come as a demonstration of good and the things that we want to put behind us as as those who become an example of things that are evil or bad. We pray, Father, that we recognize these in our own lives and we repent and stay faithful to you. This is our prayer in Christ Jesus' holy name. Amen. Amen. Apparently, it's going to be one of those nights with my mouth, so bear with me tonight. Um, Let's open up to Acts chapter 16. And as we're looking at this uh, final couple of uh, segments for verses 6 through 15, um, we we introduced Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 and 9, and we talked about the importance of the fact that Paul told the Philippian brethren in his letter from prison to them that they were to remember the things that they had received, the things that they had seen, the things that they had been taught, uh, all from Paul. And we're looking at the things that Paul did amongst the brethren here in Acts chapter 16 when he would come to Philippi so that we could have our own understanding of these very things that he's rekindling in them to remember. And the very first thing we came across is he came across people that were already religious, meaning they already had an understanding of God. Uh, And as we come across uh, Lydia, who is the seller of purple, Paul is... Uh, gone down to the river because there was not a synagogue here in Philippi. And this is where prayer was customarily made. He has found Lydia and her household, these women, down by the river praying. And Paul is going to break to her the gospel, share with her the gospel. And Luke shares that her heart was exceedingly receptive uh, to receive it. In contrast, Uh, to the many occasions when Paul would go to those who were already religious, in particular the children of Israel, and preach the gospel to find that their hearts were often closed to the truth. Uh, And as this is shared with us, we see that the end result, of course, at the end of the gospel is we would see Lydia and her household become obedient to that gospel, and they would be baptized Uh, And this would continue the pattern that we have seen since the day of Pentecost, uh, that those were being added to the church in the same exact pattern as it was in Acts chapter 2, after being cut to their heart and being 
uh, questioning the apostles as what they should do. They were told to repent and be baptized, every one of them in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of the sins so they could receive then the gifts of continued faithfulness through the Spirit of God. Uh, Lydia and her household are going to follow that same exact pattern uh, at the end of the preaching that's going to happen here. Do we, do we ever have opportunity to, to preach the truth to those who already uh, may have an understanding of God? Okay, and that means that we should attack them and tell them we're going to hell right away in the first part of our conversation, right? Okay, good. I pray that, I hope that that's the truth, because I have known the other side of the coin where that actually did happen. With that said, listen, it needs to mirror uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, and it's a, it's a powerful verse that all of us should come to understand. And Paul's telling Timothy as an evangelist, he says, the servant of the Lord must not quarrel. Must not means you, you can do it if you feel like it, right? No. Must not means what? Good. This is not who we are. This is not the way the gospel was meant to be shared with hearts of people. Must not quarrel, but patient. Wow. Every teacher of the truth needs to learn that one, huh? Patient, able to teach. The biggest part that comes out of 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 24, then again in verse 25, is that Paul tells Timothy, if perhaps God will grant them repentance. Where am I in that? It, I'm out of the equation. I'm simply sharing the power of salvation is the word of God in Christ Jesus, isn't it? It's not that they would ever reject me. Yes, they're rejecting God if they reject it. If they accept it, they're not accepting me. They're accepting God. Right, Mary? Good. That's our attitude and the attitude way we should approach the teaching and sharing the gospel. In Acts chapter 18, we're going to see Priscilla and Aquila pull Apollos aside and better instruct him, meaning that he simply was missing some pertinent information. They recognized that. They didn't say, listen, dummy, you're doing it all wrong. They simply shared with him what he was missing. And we see the results. Mary. If we find something that's very precious and we believe it, and we know we didn't come up with it, we don't have any pride in sharing it. We just want to share it because we love it and we want to give it to someone else. And if we can understand the gospel is that way and that only by the grace of God are we saved, and if we have pride and arrogance and think of it as something that we have earned or we know more because we've studied more or have learned more from a faithful congregation then there's pride involved that's pride and when we teach others not only does that come across but when they reject it we take it personal because it's pride and when you have the right spirit that I'm sharing something because it's true and I want to help you that's love and when they reject it you're not taking it personal. You're just heartbroken like Jesus was. Absolutely. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians, the first four chapters. He finds himself in a position having to lecture the brethren in Corinth because they had preacheritis. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, Peter. At the end of the day, his understanding was this. I've planted in Apollos water, but God gives the increase. That needs to be our attitude in all things. He says in chapter 4 and verse 1, uh, it's in all to understand that we're just stewards, he says. We're just servants. And the first thing that any steward should be known for is that they're first faithful. Faithful to who? God. Their master, God. Good. And at the end of the day, that's all we are as servants. It should not ever be about us. It should simply be about the truth. And listen, and you're absolutely right. This, this is a good point. Each of us should take into account how blessed each of us truly are and that God has seen fit to allow our hearts to see the value inherent in salvation in Christ Jesus and that none of us deserved it, that it was a free gift to us that we had to accept for ourselves and in doing so, our gratitude is through the roof and we would love to share such joy with others. It's that simple. And if that's the attitude in sharing it, it's much more palatable. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's all about, isn't it? We're selling benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And we're all at different uh, stages. 
in our understanding. And so you have to be patient with other people. Sure. If people hadn't been patient with me in the very beginning, I knew nothing about the Bible. How much did Lydia know, other than her Jewish background, about living in Christ now? Mm -hmm. So she's going to constrain Paul to stay. She's going to want to learn from him. Uh, he, she's going to be blessed. He is going to stay with her. And then even after he's going to be released from his little prison uh, venture here in a little bit, he's going to go back and stay with her a little bit longer before he leaves. What a blessing to be able to be founded and grounded uh, before Paul had to leave. And then he's going to leave who behind, which I kind of cheated and already told you. He's going to leave Luke behind to continue to found, to keep them grounded, if you will, right? What a blessing so that they could remain grateful, remain in their in their mode of growth and service and faithfulness and appreciation for all that God's done for them. And you're right. Uh, Peter says, as a newborn babe desires the sincere milk of the word that they may grow thereby. thereby. It's, it should be instinctual and everybody blessed with the blessings we've been given with to want to then inherently grow in it. Right? To then become Hebrews chapter 5 that we should then become teachers ourselves, ready to both encourage one another, strengthen each other in the word, and to share it with those on the outside to become part of those on the inside. What, what a great role. But once again, it's a privilege to serve. So Luke joined them late in the, in the journey and kind of crossed the water to Philippi and stayed there? Is, so again, is that yes, Luke? he's going to leave with them from Troas. He's going to go with them. He's now, the pronouns are we and us, uh -huh. now that they're in Philippi. Uh -huh. okay? But when they leave Philippi to go to Thessalonica, it's going to be they and them again. So he wasn't with them long. No, not very long at all. And he's going to stay here until Paul picks him back up uh, at the return on the third journey. So oh, he's going okay. to stay here for some time. Oh, okay. Yeah, yeah we'll, we'll come back across that here in a little bit. All right, let's move on. All right, uh, for the next segment, uh, verses 16 through 24, remember that we're looking at the things that the brethren in Philippi were to notice in Paul. Uh, as we go through our exercise, we're going to see the Apostle Paul is now going to produce good works, even in the face of uh, great adversity. Do we come across adversity in our lives day in and day out? Sure. Is that ever a time when good works aren't who we are, even if we face adversity? What makes, but first of all, I guess I should ask, what makes the works good? God said so. Okay, so they're done in Christ, right? Uh, and that's a very important part. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10 tells us that these works were planned before we even were, that we should walk in them, live in them, okay? Uh, and these good works that we're talking about are some of the very things we've been sharing in gratitude and service in sharing the gospel and teaching the gospel and grounding brethren in the in the truth and sharing it with those who may not know it and growing ourselves and understanding what it is to continually turn away from the things that we ought not practice these are all things that we find within the confines of scripture that become the character of those in christ uh, romans chapter 12 the in the entire chapter is a wonderful chapter in the character and the life of a Christian, the expected change, uh, transformation that comes by the renewing of our minds that we prove what is a good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Uh, starting in verse 9 down to the end of the chapter, beautiful transformation uh, practices that if we live those things in our lives, people will ask us of the hope that's in us. Galatians chapter 5, we, we all probably familiar with the fruit of the Spirit. Remember, there's no law against the fruit of the Spirit. Anything that we do in the Spirit means that if there's no law, means you can't be guilty of sin practicing those things. Hmm, interesting, huh? Something to think about. Um, we move to uh, Colossians chapter 3. We were given the, the entire chapter as a character of the new man. We put away the old man. We put on the new man who looks like who? Christ himself. Good. And this is the character that is developed in the new man all through the third chapter. Uh, Second Peter chapter 1, we have the add to, add to your faith, virtue, virtue, knowledge. All the characteristics of growth that come in the life of every child of God through the word. 
All of these things become great study habits. Uh, learn to pick them out. Go to Romans chapter 12 and start in verse 9 and pick out these characteristics and try to practice them daily. Take one, just take one a week. Try to, try to just love without hypocrisy for a whole week. Really think about what that means. Abhor evil for a whole week in all of its forms. It means no gray areas anymore. Don't flirt with it ever. Try it for all week. See how it works. These are the character of the new man. This is the attitude that we have that Christ teaches us to help us overcome in this life. Okay, so good works in the face of adversity. Let's start in verse 16 and let's read down to verse 19. <clears throat> Excuse me. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain... By the way, did you see the we? Who's with them? Luke. Okay, good. As we went uh, to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with the spirit of divination met us who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are the servants of the Most High God, who proclaim to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days, but Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas and dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. Now, as we take a look at an example of doing works, good works in the face of adversity, the very first thing that most people want to ask about this is this spirit of divination. Um, uniquely, the, the word used here uh, to translate this uh, into the spirit of divination, ruthun. Uh, ruthun is the root or elementary word in our English language for the word python. And in the Greek language, it was symbolic of a large serpent. Uh, and it's interesting that even in Greek culture and going back as early as Genesis chapter 3, um, we see serpents as always a reference to that which is not good. Um, my wife would probably tell you that she still thinks that of, of certain serpents, even though we had one as a pet when my kids were little for many years. And she thought that was the cutest little thing ever. And it was a little, just a little thing, and it was kind of cute. But at any rate, uh, to see him outdoors just normally, she doesn't have that same feeling. Now, with all that said, um, the importance of understanding what's going on here is, remember in Acts chapter 2 and verse 22, that Jesus of Nazareth was a man attested to by God by signs and wonders. He was attested that he had been sent by God by the very miracles that he did. Okay, And he showed that he had power over the things of this world and the things out of this world. And normally would be a domain not of this world, okay? And to allow such things, God allowed this practice to take place, this spirit divination, if you will, or um, being overtaken by them and so forth, so that God could show his ability and his power in these realms. This is Mark 16, chapter 20, for the confirmation of the word carried over through the apostles of Jesus Christ in the same exact way, so that they could confirm the word. Remember, everything with God is purpose oriented, meaning there's a purpose and an order to it. This is for the sake of showing us and confirming to us that the ones that were sharing the word with us were sharing the word from God himself, not from themselves, and to testify that the power behind these things were, in fact, the power of God. It's important that we keep that straight in our heads and our minds. Uh, for the sake of understanding these things. Now, okay, go ahead. Oh, just a question. Now, how did Python become? It's the root, 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 the rudimentary word for our English word, Python, comes from Ruthan, uh, the Greek word. Definitely. How many of you have ever seen the spelling bees on TV? Okay. So the little kids get up there and they do the spelling bees, mm -hmm. and they give them a word, and they're going to say what? What's the, what's the language of origin, right? All of our English words come from 
other languages. Uh, Greek, by the way, if you didn't know that, Greek is the primary <laughs> foundational language for our English language. Second to that would be Latin. Third to that would be Gaelic, coming from overseas and primarily the Isles of Britain. Does that help at all? It, that doesn't mean they're going to spell alike or actually be pronounced the same way. Well, divination, you're saying it's... Um, the spirit of a snake is what, what Paul called it. Oh, okay. And that it relates to she was a fortune teller. Well, she's, she's been taken over by this, and she's able to tell people's fortune because of the spirit living in her. And bringing her masters what, what? Money. That becomes important in the story, by the way. She's making them rich because they're able to tell fortune, and guess what's happening in this fortune telling? It's happening. That, that, she's actually doing it? Apparently so, because she's making a ton of money for them. Because that's what's going to cause them to take Paul and uh, Silas to the authorities. That spirit knew who Christ was. <laughs> but before we get all caught up in that, let me help us understand it, okay? Yeah. Because she's going to make a statement to us, right? Um, she's going to she's going to say that these are the servants of what? The Most High God. Now wait a minute, is that wrong? No. Oh, see, there's some accuracy going on here. But what's the problem here? What's got Paul so worked up? Okay, we have a nefarious source instead of someone actually sent by God. Okay. Um, it kind of a crude example. Let me help you understand a little bit. So we, the members of the body of Christ, uh, we worship on Sundays and Wednesdays, and we would love for people to come and worship with us. And we would maybe send out a little ad in a paper saying, come worship with us Sunday morning and Wednesday night, or let us have a Bible study with you. Okay, if we ran that newspaper, would anybody think twice about it? Not much. But what if we put it on the side of a Budweiser truck running up and down the street? There might be an issue or two with that. Huh? It's not that the message was wrong, but it was the source that was sharing the message. Does that make sense? So that's what, got, that's what has Paul all worked up about this. It is exactly this. Um, the demon... Uh, is not what God intended to witness the truth in any way, shape, or form. So he, he wants us not to share. So what I kind of mentioned, I cheated and told you a little bit about Romans chapter 12, verse 9. There's one thing we as Christians are allowed to be prejudiced against. Did you know what it is? Evil. He says we're to abhor it. It means hate it with prejudice. Okay. Um, is Paul showing us this right here? Yeah. Absolutely. To this end, we want the Word of God to have no association with anything that is evil. I always thought that it was faith. They were in some way pulling the wool over people's eyes. That it was craftiness. But you're saying that she could actually do it? Well, the inference here in the Scripture is that she's being able to make her masters very successful. I don't know that any of them were too good at this, although we do see Simon in Acts chapter 8 uh, had been very, very successful in pulling the wool over people's eyes for quite some time until they saw the real deal. And then that was over. Yeah, yeah that was over. So I'm not going to, I'm not going to stand in concrete on that one. Let's put it that way. However, the inference is that the masters were getting rich off this because apparently it's working. Still does today, but it's you know, sleight of hand. And, and I'm okay with that. Rick, go ahead. It, it's, it seems a little a questionable in a way because, you know, the, the Jews knocked everything they said. But, but this girl was telling them that what these men said was true, and she must have had a reputation of being able to tell the future and tell the truth which would have completely been against what the Jews would have been saying about the Christians. So it seemed like it was actually supporting the apostles' words. But it wasn't her saying it. Well, there, there's nothing she's saying that's wrong. And right. she's not a Jew, by the way. Well, that's These what are I'm saying. Gentiles. Well, I, I take it she had a reputation of, since she was a fortune teller, 
If she couldn't predict the future, then nobody would have paid any attention to her. But she could tell the future, and she was telling people that, that these men were from God, where the, where the Jews would have been saying the exact opposite. So here's somebody that is not associated with them telling them, yes, these are speakers of God bringing God's true message. Well, she did say that. Right. There's nothing insinuating that she was doing that to promote them other than to recognize who that they truly did serve different than their masters might go ahead. I think the important thing to not lose sight of the fact that this was a demonic spirit. Yes. That this was yes. her doing the fortune telling. This was a, an indwelling spirit because it said when Paul told that spirit to come out, the spirit they immediately did. came out. Yeah. And the masters are no longer making money. Everything's done. Right. There, so everybody knows right away that she's done. She can't do what she was able to do. That's the inference I'm talking about uh, going forward. Well, and I, I was going to say the demonic spirits are very real. And so it's frightening because now a lot of young people are toying with tarot cards. And they're like portals to demonic spirits. So I think we almost do ourselves wrong when we think it's all fake. I mean, they're, they're real. Satan masquerades as an angel of light. So I think we have to take very seriously that these spirits are real and they will work to deceive people. And they do have to have a little bit of credibility to get people to follow them. But, um, you know, again, especially today, you can see young people's concerts and they literally look like Satan is on the stage. So there's a lot of people flirting with these demonic portals and, and I think we really need to take that really seriously. I won't disagree with that. Uh, there's more to that when we get to Corinth. We're going to talk a lot about this uh, uh, representation of evil in our lives and how comfortable uh, society gets with it and the dangers inherent to that. I saw another hand before I move on. One quick question. Um, Rick kind of made me think about it. When Paul comes to Acts chapter 19, in Acts chapter 19, there is a uh, school of sorcery in Ephesus. Um, Paul's going to preach the truth there. They're going to see the power of God in demonstrating the truth. The entire school is going to take all their books out and they're going to burn them. Uh, a, a large, costly sum. Uh, Luke even mentions how, that it's uh, a very large sum of money worth of books they're going to burn because of the teaching and preaching of the Apostle Paul in Ephesus. But there were Jews there, sons of Sceva, uh, who was a priest, who were traveling exorcists, Jews, by the way. And, and just real quick, I want to make sure that we're reminded, what was God's attitude about uh, sorcery and even exorcism? That, that was a stonable offense in the Jewish faith. But yet the sons of this priest are traveling around saying that they can cast out demons. And they saw Paul perform miracles in the name of Jesus Christ. And they, they tried to cast out a demon by stating and emphatically, in the name of Jesus Christ that Paul preaches come out. That's the words they chose. And the demon's response was, Jesus we know, Paul we know, you we don't have any idea. And then the, that one demon-possessed man jumped on him and beat him up, and they ran down the street naked. And you can't make that kind of stuff up. The point is, um, the legitimate powers being demonstrated here have a purpose. And that purpose is to demonstrate that these things are truly from God. And that's the important part we got to remember. And it didn't matter if the Jews did or didn't, because there were times that the Jews when it suited them, would pick out things that they wanted to play with and they wanted to be part of. But when it didn't suit them, they had no trouble throwing it away either. Um, we, had, we need to be careful about such practices in our lives uh, as well. I thought what's, I saw another hand. Get up there. What's odd is that why would the demon, like, what's the point of the demon being there? Why would he be there? 
she is just furthering that they are telling the truth. So it would be working against the demon. Wouldn't the demon want to go into hiding or like run away because he knows they can, he, they, he can just be cast out? Or um, Write down in your notes, right next to this passage, I want you to write James chapter 2 and verse 19. This is the segment that James teaches that faith without works is dead. Okay. Um, and he's going to use as an example of worthless belief that the demons themselves believe, but they tremble instead of obeying. It is the recognition of the power that Paul represents in Christ Jesus that's causing this woman to speak out. Well, you see them respond that way to Jesus, too. Absolutely. They did. They all feared him. And yeah. they acknowledge him. They, right. I, I think they can't help Confessed it, him. You know. Yeah. And fear. Are you saying the demons? Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes. Like where he said, uh, I always read it, and like the, evil, she, the, evil, the spirit was acknowledging them. They were uh, men of God and mocked them. That's the way I always took that. And then she, and then she followed them. And she, he cast them out non immediately. They <coughs> was with them for a, a, some kind of a time period, and then he then he cast them out. Well, our, our text I don't believe bears that out, does it? Well, it's it's many days. Uh, yeah, it's many days? days. Okay. Um, part of this, I guess, I haven't paid as much attention to, but uh, apparently Paul's had enough of it, though. At the point where he throws <laughs> it out, yeah, he yeah, yeah. doesn't want to play with that anymore. My, I, I think curious first. Okay, I just have a question because I'm getting confused. <laughs> is it the girl that's saying this, or is it the demon that's saying this? The demon through the girl. Okay, okay. So she's not at this point until Paul throws her out. They're one and the same. Okay, so he's con the demon is controlling her. It's not her own correct th thoughts. Okay, that's what I correct. Okay, you know, Mike. <clears throat> something maybe for. I was thinking of is that Paul wants to conduct his business on his terms and maybe there's times he wants to be able to pass through the city and not have you know his business basically announced to the whole world think about people who are famous when they walk outside of a restaurant and there's 10 paparazzi there to take their picture in a crowd and after a while they become annoyed at that so think about somebody walking behind you in a department store stating your business to the world if they knew who you were yeah. you'd become annoyed at that too and Paul so is kind of see that yeah Paul is developing quite the reputation at this yeah. point too we're going to see this in Thessalonica next uh, he's going to go there and they're going to state emphatically that uh, Paul and his company these have, who have come here have turned the world upside down mm -hmm. uh, we'll share that when we get there but yeah they're developing quite the reputation up to this point um, anything else, real quick? I was hoping to go a little bit further. Okay, I know. I don't know why I hope that ever, but at any rate, all right. Let's read down verses twenty through twenty-four. Um, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, "These men, being Jews, exceedingly trouble our city." Circle the word Jews, by the way. It's going to play into why only Paul and Silas are the ones being arrested at this point, not. Uh, Timothy and Luke. We'll come back to that. Uh, and they teach customs that are not lawful for us, being Romans, to receive or observe. Then the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates tore off their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods. And when they had laid many stripes on them, they threw them into prison, commanding the jailer to keep them securely. Having received such a charge, they put them into the inner prison and fasten their feet in the stocks. Now, uh, as we move forward, remember Philippi is the capital of Macedonia. Uh, it should not surprise us then that the praetors or the judicial rulers uh, of this province are, are located here. And these are the ones that Paul and Silas are being brought uh, to. Uh, it should be important because the question always comes up, well, why just Paul and Silas? Um, remember that in a Roman city without a synagogue, uh, what is usually the attitude of Romans towards Jews? They're just all good buddies, right? And they love them. Okay, they don't like them. It, it's 
probably that Paul and Silas are being brought because they think they're going to get a favorable judgment from the magistrates because they are what? Jews, okay, at the end of the day. And although Timothy was raised by his Jewish grandmother, his father was a Gentile, etc. So uh, we see this take place. Now, is persecution going to be something new to the Apostle Paul? What happened in Lystra on the first journey? He was stoned and left for dead. He's going to be run out of, uh, he was run out of Antioch. He was going to run out again from Iconium. The same Jews from Antioch and Iconium were the ones that were responsible, came to Lystra to run him out of there. Paul has known already quite a bit of persecution. Uh, some good reading, by the way, uh, just to uh, come to uh, Acts chapter 20 in history. But a laundry list of the suffering of the Apostle Paul, he gives an orderly account in 2 Corinthians chapter 11 of the suffering that he has gone through just up to Acts 20 uh, in our historic narrative. And it's going to increase even after that uh, substantially. He's going to talk about being stoned and left for dead, beaten this many times. Uh, there's a whole laundry list. And we're going to talk, we're going to probably end our time talking a little bit about this beating. Now, before I get into that, I, I want to share there's I'm going to take this moment to share a little bit about the Roman practice of beating universally. And I know that in our text, specifically Luke records that they use rods to beat the Apostle Paul. Um, the Romans, just so you know, had two penalties for crimes. Who, who wants to take a guess? What was the first one? What was commonly the penalty for committing a crime in a Roman Empire? Well, depending on the crime, usually the death penalty was the first one. Beating was kind of a secondary thing, and they had to kind of like you a little bit just to beat you, or it had to be pretty mild just to beat you. So two penalties in the Roman Empire for crime, death and beating. That was it. So what was the Romans' attitude about uh, deterrence? They believed in them, didn't they? They wanted to make sure that anybody committing a crime, that they were going to be taken care of in such a way as either they couldn't physically never do it again or they were going to be beaten until they would never ever think of doing it again okay and and they were very public about it for that reason now with that said the the practices of beating for the romans was very subjective uh, versus the Jews. The Jews were under the law of Moses, and under the law of Moses, they were only allowed to be uh, whipped 40 times. Uh, how many of you remember in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that you weren't to uh, abuse the uh, oxen as it tread out grain? Right? Comes from Deuteronomy. In Deuteronomy, that comes from uh, the law that commanded that you were never to enforce a punishment on someone where they could not then support their families. That was the breaking point as to how far you went in enforcing a punishment, okay? A man who's committed a crime and has been found guilty and the punishment was to be beaten, they were to be given 40 lashes. The Jews at the time of Jesus had made this into a measurable thing, so they did, uh, they did 40 minus 2 just to make sure they didn't break the law. So they stopped so graciously at 38. Uh, but at any rate, uh, there was with God an understanding but with the Romans, they didn't have such a love affair with mercy. And in the Roman ranks, especially in the cities where the praetors would exist, there were centurions whose only job was to be the taskmaster over the measuring out of these beatings. And they became very good at their task. Good enough to our understanding, and what's important for our understanding, is they became the masters of knowing how to beat you almost to death almost being the key word. They knew when to stop that you would survive. But the pain and the punishment would always be met out. And I share all that because we read through this and we'll talk about the fact that he's in prison and he's, you know, they're bound and we're going to hear them sing. They're singing praises to God, uh, living out uh, some of the very things Paul's going to command us in Philippians chapter 4. All of this to say, I don't think we appreciate much like I don't think we appreciate what Jesus went through. We were talking about this before we came in. For the 
the cause of salvation. And, and I do want to impress upon us just a little bit some of these things. So, uh, by the way, before I even get to this, the charge was not, cast, not doing the miracle. By the way, did you notice that didn't have anything to do with the charge? What was the charge? These men teach things that are against or contrary to us as Romans, right? They're teaching Jesus as what? Lord. As Lord, a king. Good. Against the Caesars, who are often those who proclaim themselves what? Kings, gods, and so forth. Okay, good. They're already kings, but gods, yes. Um, so I pulled this up. This is an artist's rendition of what they believe um, from most of the historic records. Uh, what the flagrum looked like, the, the most common tool used by the Romans, the one that was used on Jesus, beyond a shadow of a doubt. Um, it was a whip, multi-tongued, and at the end of the, each of the tongs or the... the uh, strands were tied bones and stones okay now this is secondary and there are so many devices used and once again each each of these men that were tasked with beatings became very good at what they strapped you to because the whole idea in the beating was to strap you in such a way as your back was tight and your underbelly was soft because whipping you with this it wasn't the lashes across your back that was significant. It was what that rock and bone dug into around the soft side. That really did the damage. Now, I want us to remember that in, in Isaiah chapter 52, Isaiah foretold that Jesus would be beaten so severely that he would be unrecognizable. Our, our English translation says his visage was unrecognizable. 750 years before it would transpire, the prophet foretold that that would be the extent of his beating before uh, he had to carry his cross. And now we, it shouldn't surprise us why he was unable to even carry the cross. And they had to burden um, someone else to carry it for him. All of this to say is they became very good at this and they were good with their tools. Uh, there wasn't much in history to talk about the rods. I think our own imagination and that uh, probably is sufficient that it was some sort of pretty heavy-duty stick that they would whip you with to kind of break the skin on your back as you were taught. Uh, Paul's going to receive many stripes, and, and so is Silas in the process of this beating. Um, I've fallen, when I was a young man, I fell off my skateboard going down a mountain uh, somewhere in the neighborhood of 45, 50 miles an hour nothing but a pair of cutoff shorts on, on pavement. And there was hardly any skin left on my whole body. And then, of course, I'm 16 years old and I have driver's ed that summer. And so then the Monday after the Saturday that when this happened, I had to sit in a car for a three hour driving session. And not only did the t-shirt stick to my skin and pull off, and I know this is kind of gruesome, but bear with me. But if you can imagine sitting in a car that long with all that, you know, road rash. Imagine Paul laying on a stone floor in a prison cell with his back laid wide open, uh, chained, by the way, and singing praises in the middle of the night. Let that be the last thought in your mind until we get to next week and we talk about why the other prisoners were listening intently to them.